So I did say that I was going to talk about uh, some more of the uh, sociological aspects of uh, delinquency. And again, just a reminder, this is a lot of uh, philosophy and psychology. So apologies if this gets a little uh, mind-numbing, but I'm trying my best to get through it as uh, clear as possible. Uh, I'll tell you right now with strain theory, uh, much like I did last time, page 105 and figure 4.3. That can't be right. I already said 4.3 on page 103. Ah, that'd be why. That's actually figure 4.2. So hopefully you watch this one and go, oh, you made a mistake. Anyway, um, figure 4.3 is the elements of general strain theory. And <coughs> strain theory comes from uh, Robert Agnew. Again, if you are familiar with psychology or you're interested in psychology, Agnew is a popular name. Uh, he's the one that takes... Merton is the one that puts this forward, Robert Merton, but Robert Agnew is the one that kind of makes this big and talks about general strain theory. Um, and this is kind of taking the Maslow hierarchy of needs and kind of turning it on its side and say, hey, guess what? Sources of strain or causes of our uh, negative ill feelings lead to negative emotional states, affective states, which then tend to lead to antisocial behavior, which in a child, in a delinquent, or into an adolescent is a delinquent behavior. So strain theory really looks at, you know, and I'm just going to use one part of the the overall model that is given the uh, the figure just to kind of drive this. So the failure to achieve a goal can lead an individual to be uh, depressed. Maybe even angry or both. And these actions might lead to drug use. Now, of course, you know, that very simplified is, you know, just these broad terms. So maybe it's the goal was to go to college. And for whatever reason, you failed to achieve that goal. You were not able to go to any college at all. Then you get into this emotional state where you feel depressed and angry. Uh, this might be an idea that you are a failure, and I'm not saying anyone is a failure for this. but, um, And so after you feel these feelings, you numb the pain. You medicate. You deal with it. And so this is strain theory is that Multiple factors up at this top level lead to a bunch of feelings at this level, which potentially leads to antisocial behaviors. That's general strain theory. And of course, it dives way deeper in throughout this. Um, but when we say drug use, these are, um, if you're a person that is familiar with uh, therapy, These are coping strategies, both good and bad. So drug use is a bad coping strategy. A good coping strategy is writing about it, things like that, um, depending on who you talk to. Anyway, point is, is that strain theory is all about, not strain, strain theory. Strain theory is all about how different factors impact our emotional state, which leads us to potential deviant behavior or potential delinquent behavior. And so there's a reason I said deviant because we need to talk about this bad boy. Called 
cultural deviance theory. Um, so cultural deviance theory holds that uh, yeah, I'm just going to write it. Um, essentially, cultural deviance theory is that the culture of an individual uh, they have different values than the larger society. So this is where we get things like, uh, and again, I mentioned this before, glorified thug life. Gangster. Gangster life. Like, this is a real issue. Cultural de deviance theory states that delinquency is more of a result of this, that the culture that the individual comes from is different than what society says. It glorifies these negative things, these uh, deemed by society wrong things. And so all of a sudden we have uh, some kind of disorganized behavior, uh, particular these, the culture of an individual uh, we tend, in particular, to talk about, um, oh gosh, what's the word? Socially disorganized? Technically neighborhoods? So, these are things like areas where uh, crime has increased and uh, there's no real any kind of social gathering or uh, social structure that says what's right and what's wrong or rather the right or wrong is problematic at best that's cultural deviance theory and within this is this concept of culture conflict and this is where that butting of the heads. This is where you have a teen that's in the gangsta lifestyle. But they're in Somehow they're in a middle-class suburbia school. You have this culture conflict of this teen who has lived in an area that is all about the gangsta life. And it is kill or be killed. But they are now in this environment where it's middle-class suburbia. You have to be a certain way, dress a certain way, act a certain way. And these come in conflict. And this leads individuals to lash out and try to find their middle ground. And oftentimes this leads to this kind of delinquency, this issue. And so um, <coughs> thinking about cultural deviance theory and culture conflict and thinking back to what I said about the discussion board that's uh, for this these readings, who do we blame? Is, is a child responsible for what is essentially their environment like how do we deal with this how do we deal with uh movies and shows and albums glorifying these violent and honestly inappropriate behaviors um and that gets into a deeper argument that i'll bring up in the discussion board anyway this is an important piece and when we have this kind of uh, 
any kind of uh, social issues, we have to look at, uh, excuse me, how we socialize. Specifically socialization. How do we essentially rehabilitate? Remember, the goal of the juvenile justice system for the most part is rehabilitative. So how do we socialize these individuals who are delinquents, who are on those outskirts? And so these are things like uh, parental efficacy, So, you know, uh, the parents are supportive of uh, their children and they control them without coercing them. So, you know, without promising something and stuff like that. Um, schools play a role in this. So obviously uh, with schools, this is an interesting thing to note. And I'm sure hopefully some of you may be familiar with this. Uh, but if the teacher doesn't care, why should you? And that's the kind of ultimate piece with socialization in regards to schools is that uh, when you have schools where individuals that are in that teacher role if they don't care about the student, if they don't care about the well-being, if they don't care about any of this stuff, if they treat a potential or a, an actual delinquent in a different manner that is not uh, at all supportive, then it's not going to work. There's, there's no rehabilitation from the social aspect from the school. Uh, obviously, I shouldn't have to mention this or how its impact is, but... Uh, we all know that peers tend to be the biggest factor, especially in adolescence. You want to fit in, and that's, that's something that, you know, is a human thing. We want to fit in. And so our peer group tends to be, this is the big one. This is the big impact for, um, for adolescents, for uh, delinquency, there tends to be some kind of uh, desire to fit in, whether it's uh, a desire to fit in with peers or a desire to fit in with uh, <coughs> family, things like that. But the unfortunate reality is uh, fitting in and finding a group is not always a good thing. So in particular, um, just because you find a group of like-minded individuals doesn't mean that uh, that's a positive peer group. There is a difference between a good and a bad peer group. Um, so our textbook mentions several of them, um, but it's interesting to note that how uh, just because you find groups doesn't mean it's right because we have something called a confirmation bias. Uh, this is a research term, uh, but confirmation bias means that you only find data that confirms what you already believe. Uh, when we talk about socialization, when we talk about delinquency, when we talk about uh, peer groups, confirmation bias is we are going to gravitate towards people that agree with us, whether it's true or not. If someone agrees with us, we're going to follow them. <coughs> this is the nature of humans. Uh, anyway, just wanted to put that out there. Um, so I mentioned before uh, a term, and I'm going to come back to it here in just a second, but uh, in particular, uh, socialization has an impact on delinquency. Um, in particular, the our text breaks it down into three areas, learning, control, and labeling. Uh, learning is pretty straightforward. We know that uh, we are beings that are learning behaviors. We learn the behavior. So uh, learning is, you know, if we show that 
you can be something else that works. Control is sometimes uh, not able to control themselves or their urges. So this idea is that uh, family, peers, society, school, uh, these bonds have made them uh, actually be controlled or rather be uh, less rebellious. But labeling. Labeling's big, and I talked about it before briefly. Um, and I'm going to write it here, too. Labeling has a serious impact. And I think we need to talk about it more often. Uh, we will be touching... You know what? Let's just talk about it right now. Uh, it is it is talked about in the textbook on page... Uh, starts on page 113 under social reaction labeling theories. <laughs> But <coughs> the long story short on labeling, when individuals are labeled, specifically when juveniles are labeled as a delinquent, there is this idea that it has a long-term effect. It is not just in that moment. The long-term effect is it tends to follow them the rest of their lives. And yes, we can talk about, you know, locked juvenile records and things like that. But the fact that there's a locked juvenile record puts up red flags. Um, there is a negative stigma with being regarded as a juvenile delinquent. And even the text brings out the label deviant becomes a social outcast who should be prevented from enjoying higher education well-paying jobs, and other societal benefits. If the goal is to rehabilitate, but the ultimate point of labeling is that we are making them a social outcast and they're going to be prevented from doing other things, is that really rehabilitating or is that punishing? There's a larger issue here. I'm not... I'm intentionally bringing it in broader terms because, yeah, we can look at specific examples and why it works the way it does and why it shouldn't work a certain way. But it's important to remember that every case is different. Every Whether you are into the criminal justice uh, program and into that field because you want to be a corrections officer, a police officer, a parole officer, uh state trooper, a lawyer, a uh, juvenile advocate, whatever it is that you want to do, the reality is every case is different. We set precedent so that when things are similar, we have a way to go forward. But every case is different. So consider that in whatever decision you make in your own uh, career with criminal justice. Um, anyway, when we talk about this, uh, socialization and the, uh, culture of individuals who are, uh, part of our lives or rather the uh, child's life and things like that, um, there is an idea of, uh, conformity, uh, versus delinquency. So obviously, we want individuals to conform, not be delinquent. I have issues with those terms, but I have issues with authority. Irony in that one. Um, but what this really looks at is uh, social interactions. Uh what am I trying to say? I I got off track because I wanted to talk about that. Um, ignore that. So when we talk about conformity and delinquency, uh, we're talking about specifically a social bond. This is the idea that an individual creates some kind of attachment uh, that leads them to being more... Uh, of the conforming behavior rather than delinquent behavior. 
Uh, this is things like whether it's the commitment to a career or success, or it's a belief that, you know, in fairness, uh, whether it's involvement in a sport or attachment to a family member or religious individual or friend or community service, whatever it is, when you conform to those things, when you create a social bond with an individual in those areas, you tend to want to conform. If you do not have any of those connections or you have a strong desire against it, you tend to engage in delinquent behavior. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, anyway, that I because I went backwards and forward and backwards, I got out of it. So apologies for me uh, being a little disconnected here. All right. Um, getting back on track. Critical theory. Um, critical theory is brought up in our textbook on page 116. Um, but critical theory is this idea that society is in a constant state of internal conflict. Um, this is something that I'm sure you're familiar with. Um, this is the idea that uh, those in power So basic breakdown is uh, for critical theory, those who are in power push their standard on those who are not in power. Uh, this is where we get ideas like the rich decide what is illegal. And so uh, most crimes are intended to punish the poor because a rich person can pay the fee, but a poor person can't. So then they have to go to jail. Um, this is a larger issue. Talking about critical theory in this way is like very microscopic it's it's not looking at everything um but uh if you like s ridiculous references uh futurama there's a joke about critical theory uh in season three's episode insane in the mainframe i believe it's season three it's season three or season four uh but fry and bender are unintended accomplices in a bank robbery and they both get sentenced to a robot insane asylum because, and I quote, um, the judge, Judge Whitey, uh, ruled that being poor was a crime and a mental illness, and so therefore they were all locked up, and all the poor people. So, yeah, this is what critical theory technically is saying, is that the people in power decide what is right and what is to be followed, and so then the powerless the poor are the ones that deal with this and have to struggle with this and that's it's a larger concept there's a lot more to it there's a lot of nuances but um the takeaway is that people in power the elite make the laws and they have a disproportionate impact on the poor and that's what leads to uh, higher rates of delinquency in uh, poor neighborhoods as well as neighborhoods of color that's really what the long story short of all this is, is that that's what critical theory is talking about. All right. So that pretty much covers these two chapters. I know I kind of went over a lot of it very quickly, um, but in reality, it's really hard to talk about all of this um, in what is essentially a extended class lecture. Um, even if we were in person, we would have essentially two whole classes, which are both two to three hours each on each one of these. It's, there's so much content. Um, 
there was no way that this was going to be an easy short video. So, look at all this red. This is all this just the sociological stuff. It's about as much as what he wrote in the blue and the black. So, big takeaway from all of this. If you had to uh, boil down what chapters 3 and 4 were really about, it's that there is a lot of potential biological, psychological, and sociological components that lead to juvenile delinquency. It is not just one thing. And even within those sections, there are theories and ideas of how it works. There is no one answer. There is no easy answer. And to think there is, is misunderstanding. So that's what we have. Um, yeah. Anyway, uh, thank you for listening to these lecture videos. Again, apologies for my voice. I am getting better. Uh, it's not nearly where it was, but it's also not back to 100%. So again, apologies. Anyway, uh, hope you all are doing okay. Um, I'll see you all soon.